Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Friday, February 24th, uh, 2023, on a Saturday. Filming around the same time as last week, so it seems like the light is similar. I thought it might be a little darker outside today, but <laughs> anyway, it's going to be kind of strange, I suppose. I feel like this was a pretty uh, ho-hum week. Uh, I had work, but not a whole lot of other stuff going on. Although I don't feel like I was as productive as I might have hoped to be outside of work hours. But <laughs> I did end up having to battle my uh, scanner printer uh, in the near past. Uh, I had replaced a cartridge and then it stopped communicating with the computer. You know, I wasn't able to scan or print, you know, the things you're supposed to do. Uh, and so I was fiddling with that a little bit, and I think I got it working again, although it's not quite as, uh, I don't know, easy as it used to be, or at least one, uh, one part of it isn't working the way it used to. Uh, kind of like this camcorder, in fact, which is uh, mostly working how it used to, but I had to replace uh, a chip, and uh, sometimes I still get buffering messages that interrupt my filming, so... <laughs> But for the most part, things work, so I don't know. I'm having inane, frustrating uh, technological problems. <laughs> But I also do think I was able to get some reading done uh, this uh, week, which is what I'm here for. So, uh, so uh, as per usual with these videos, I'll get to going through uh, all of those now. So let's get started. Uh, starting uh, as is my uh, new custom that I started this month of reading one story per week in this collection, Oi Karumba, an anthology of Jewish stories from Latin America by Ilan Stavins. And this week I read The Closed Coffin by Marcello Bermager. I'm hoping I'm saying that somewhat correctly. Uh, and it was an interesting uh, sort of story which centered around a man who uh, was writing a book review in uh, the middle of the night and had to leave his house. He was feeling distracted. His family was asleep, but there was noise outside and yada yada. So he went out to this like all night like bar to write uh, and he runs into this old acquaintance who he hasn't seen in years and the friend is named Pancho I think they know each other from childhood living in a Jewish neighborhood they both have some Jewish ancestry uh, and the big selling point about Pancho is uh, that he remembers is that uh, his father died when they were young uh, but it turns out, as the two of them get to talking about their lives, uh, that uh, Pancho's father didn't die. And in fact, he ran off with his non-Jewish uh, girlfriend uh, to Paraguay. But then they ended up coming back uh, to, uh, to Argentina, where this story uh, ultimately takes place. Uh, and I think in uh, divulging information about sort of the skeletons in Pancho's closet and his uh, parents' closet about marriage and relationships, uh, it makes the reviewer, I don't know, if, if not admit to himself, then admit to us through like going through, uh, you know, the catalog of his own family issues that uh, his own relationships also seem a bit, uh, you know, strained or uh, not as uh, good as they might appear to be. And then the final part of the story is that throughout it, and this weird interaction he has, uh, his opinion about uh, the novel he's reviewing changes. Like at the beginning, he's talking about giving it a pretty scathing or at least uh, uh, bad review about its inanities. Uh, and then by the end of the novel, he's uh, sitting down to write and he's only saying soaring good things about it. So <laughs> I guess uh, maybe he couldn't be as cynical anymore about what the author was trying to do dramatically after uh, going through that conversation and, and unearthing old secrets. Next, I finished uh, The Lightness of Water and Other Stories by Rhonda Browning White. This was what I picked up for my page 112 tag. I think last week I was about halfway through and uh, yeah, I went through the rest of the collection and I uh, largely liked it. These are stories that take place all around West Virginia mostly, uh, and uh, the characters usually uh, are a little bit different story to story, but uh, it does uh, have that same setting. And I think most of them, you might say, are lower middle class, and a lot of these stories deal with financial problems or, or drugs and drug abuse uh, often come into them. 
Uh, and then uh, the first and the last story ended up being about the same characters, and the last story uh, kind of continued the first story. The last story is called The Big Empty, and in the first per story, The Bondsman, uh, they uh, were living, this young couple were living in um, a, a town in uh, West Virginia where, uh, you know, this coal mining company was doing uh, the whole thing of blowing tops off of mountains, and it was... Uh, destroying the town and the health of everyone in it and uh, the husband Jasper worked you know doing this very dangerous mining work uh, but uh, you know they were kind of uh, in a rut about how to get away or if they could get away from this because they didn't have a lot of money but uh, in the first story Jasper's father is dying so he does leave some insurance to them and uh, then there's this side hustle where he was dying of Crohn's disease and had some Oxycontin as a prescription and he gave some to Jasper to sell. And so that was uh, their way basically of getting the money to leave. And so in the second story they do leave and they go uh, out of uh, West Virginia into Kentucky and Jasper takes a job um, clearing a forest area for like condominiums that are going up. Uh, and it's supposed to be an improvement, and I guess in some ways it is, uh, you know, in terms of the general health of the area. But as the story goes on, it becomes apparent that, you know, this is the same sort of uh, environmental destruction. And there's this really tragic scene with the rabbit and her and her kids. Uh, and uh, so ultimately they aren't so uh, happy, I think, uh, with uh, their decision. And they kind of uh, are in the same sort of rut, a uh, similar sort of rut. Uh, so this one didn't work as well for me as the first story. I felt like there was a lot more, uh, I don't know, backstory or like just sort of coasting on the grace of the first story. But I really liked the first story and I read uh, in review of reviews or, you know, information I found online that I'll link below that uh, White liked these characters so much that she is now making their story into a novel. And I think these two stories are going to be two chapters in the novel. So I thought that was exciting and I'll hopefully be able to keep up with her and uh, see uh, if and when this novel is published and maybe I could read it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the other stories were also mostly pretty good. Uh, you know, you like mo some more than others, uh, but uh, the one I read for the page 112 tag was uh, probably the most different socioeconomically because uh, the characters in it were probably the most well off in that they were like steadily middle class. Uh, and uh, I know the scene I read uh, was about this woman uh, who uh, was in this flirtatious uh, situation with a man and I was picking up on, you know, these negative vibes about it and it turned out it was a kind of negative experience that this woman uh, was finally admitted into her uh, town's uh, Daughters of the Revolution Club uh, and this was, you know, the clout that she was looking for all her life, like I guess uh, you know, she had a pedigree where she was more looked down upon, but now she was able to do, you know, her research into ancestry and gain admittance. And it's supposed to like open all sorts of, you know, uh, respectable doors for her and her daughter. So she goes to her old nemesis slash, uh, you know, uh, county uh, chapter president's house sort of thing. And it's uh, this nemesis's husband who is hitting on her. And yeah, he's certainly, uh, you know, steering the boat, as it were, and being a little bit uh, forceful about uh, about what's going on. I mean, what, I wouldn't say it was all out coercion uh, exactly, but he's definitely steering the boat, and they do end up hooking up um, in that scene. Um, and later on, like, she never fully admit, <laughs> admits to this, but it sort of comes into this whole thing about what am I doing, and I'm sort of... Uh, you know, betraying who I really am, being part of this thing, and uh, ultimately she does decide, I think, to, to leave, that she doesn't want to, the, the simpering affectations of not really belonging or doing more harm to her daughter than actually belonging, uh, I think is uh, what it comes down to. So it's much more about uh, social pressures, this story, where the other stories are a little more about socioeconomic pressures and, and drugs and that sort of thing, but, but I still like to this story, which was called Heritage. And I guess the final one I'll just mention here is called Good Friends, because it reminded me so strongly of Dorothy Parker that I was getting nostalgic. Uh, I had been reading uh, Dorothy Parker short stories uh, 
as my am reading short stories in place of Oika Rumba uh, for the last uh, 20 months. Uh, and so many of Dorothy Parker's stories are uh, satirical uh, examinations of relationships, particularly that women have, particularly when they're unaware of their real like motivations or feelings. And, and I think that's what this story is about. It's about two unnamed characters, which almost reminds me of Dorothy Parker with her dashed off stories. Uh, which are a little more into dialogue than uh, this story. But this story is narrated by the son named woman who is uh, taking her, her colleague and neighbor to task about like what a hussy she is and uh, you know, what a bad influence she is. Uh, and then what a good friend this narrator is to basically put up with her and try to teach her the ropes. And it seems like so apparent through, uh, you know, the, uh, tenor of uh, this narrative that, you know, she is completely in the dark about her own uh, negative attributes and gossip and cruelty and all of that. Uh, so that's really what stuck out to me as a as a Dorothy Parker thing. Uh, it was a very different, uh, you know, narration style too. Uh, you know, a very close uh, first person, uh, sort of uh, almost like a diary entry of bitching about this other character. But yeah, I, I, I really <laughs> was feeling nostalgic for Dorothy Parker and liked how she pulled off this sort of satirical uh, relationship take. Next, I finally finished Jerusalem Beach short stories by Ido Geffen, translated from the Hebrew by Daniela Samir. I don't actually think we're going to talk about it <laughs> much. I've talked about it on two other Am Reading videos, uh, this short story collection. And uh, more excitingly, I have just started uh, this one. This is The Man Who Sold Air in the Holy Land by Omer Friedlander. And my point was to review these two collections. They're both Israeli short story collections. The authors are around the same age, same gender, I believe. Uh, so my next and final video in February should hopefully be me reviewing these two collections, comparing and contrasting them, you know, if of course I finish this one. Uh, but I have started it at least, huzzah. And it is true, I think, uh, for the rest of the weekend, my major uh, plan in re terms of reading is to tackle this collection. Because so far I've read one short story, and I liked it. Uh, the story is called Jaffa Oranges, uh, and I think it's a very uh, pertinent story about... Uh, uh, social realities in Israel and the realities about the past. Uh, but uh, a lot of it takes place in backstory. And so I feel like that kind of works against the narrative and the strength of like, you know, getting too involved with the characters. But, you know, certainly there's a lot of, uh, you know, compelling stuff in here. It's about an, an elderly man who uh, has an orange grove. Uh, and, uh, he is visited by this uh, young uh, woman, a Palestinian uh, refugee uh, who now lives in London, who is the granddaughter of this uh, young man, uh, Khalil, who he used to uh, work with or in fact work for Khalil's uh, father and, and grandfather's uh, orchard uh, in Jaffa, you know. Uh, several years ago, well, you know, during, uh, right before, you know, the war for independence. And uh, Khalil's family was one of the ones that fled, uh, you know, the violence uh, as uh, the state of Israel was uh, uh, being uh, fought for, as it were. And uh, there was a lot of uh, violence, uh, I mean, between uh, all parties, you know, the, the Jews and the, and the Arabs and also uh, the British Empire, uh, you know, sticking their foot in, trying to, I guess, keep their foothold and power uh, at the time. So we kind of go through that history of uh, who they were, you know, these two young guys uh, who I think grew up to be about 20 or something. Uh, and uh, the, the Jewish man, in fact, was, you know, a more lowly person, like his family didn't have as much uh, wealth or status. And here he was uh, working uh, for this uh, Arab Palestinians uh, uh, or uh, orchard uh, or grove, uh, I should say, and um, and in fact he was ultimately fired along with all the other Jewish employees. You know, during one of the you know periods of unrest and distrust between groups. Uh, but the relationship between Khalil and this young man was, you know, in a lot of ways uh, just two guys, you know, finding common ground uh, as young men growing up together until the broader social situations, uh, you know, uh, forced them apart and in fact, uh, 
this uh, elderly man was carrying like the secret that he uh, helped torch um, Khalil's family's orange grove, uh, ultimately as a soldier in the war for independence or the Napka. Um, and um, so that's the story he keeps on holding, like he's debating if he's going to tell uh, Khalil's granddaughter about it. Khalil had recently died and uh, the granddaughter decided to come back. Uh, and uh, one of the things she, she wanted to learn more about her grandfather and she also had this souvenir to give uh, the protagonist of the story, which uh, at one point the uh, protagonist had been thrown out of a movie uh, theater for uh, not having enough money or something like that. And Khalil went ahead and uh, got him a ticket that was printed for this, uh, this show that they were supposed to go to. And so that's what uh, the granddaughter uh, gave him. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of, you know, pertinent and uh, uh, poignant, I should say, uh, you know, realities about uh, severed relationships due to war and upheaval and that sort of thing. But, you know, since it was all told in backstory, I was a little more iffy about it. Like, you know, you, you can't get as invested when it's not like primary story in your face. Uh, but uh, that I'm still optimistic about this collection. It's been very uh, popular. I, uh, uh, about a month ago, I actually was on a Zoom call with uh, this uh, author who spoke to um, a joint synagogue book club that my synagogue and another local synagogue uh, were part of, and he spoke to the group. And I think that's online, so I'll link that below. And I recently, I think he also gave an interview with another uh, Jewish publication I follow, so I should probably, well, he's probably given a lot. So uh, I'll be able to link to uh, more information about the author down below, because I think he's been able to, you know, tout this a lot. He lives in the U.S., and so this uh, book has been getting uh, a bit of attention, I think, in terms of the attention that literary short story collections get. So uh, I'm pretty hopeful about uh, how the rest of this will go. Next, I just finished The Animators by Kayla Ray Whitaker. Uh, this was one of my top of the Goodreads picks. Uh, there are several uh, books that uh, were at the top of my Goodreads TBR that I put on uh, mostly in uh, 2018 and 2019. Uh, and uh, now, you know, being at the top of my list, I wanted to be able to uh, finally check them off. Uh, and so uh, this was one of those books, and I think it's my favorite read of the month so far. Uh, I'm uh, pretty uh, happy with it. I haven't written my Goodreads review yet, uh, so uh, I still have some things to think out. I guess I'll be using this section to segment to think them out in. But anyway, this is a uh, story that's, I feel like it's somewhat like The Interestings by Meg Wallitzer and somewhat like Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin, uh, because it's similarly looks at um, business partners and uh, people with formative experiences together who end up in an artistic career together. And in this case, uh, we're following our, our main character is Sharon, uh, who is this um, young woman from Appalachia who uh, gets a scholarship to a small college in New York where she's studying um, art and drawing in particular. Uh, and so it's it's out of kind of an out of left field thing. Like she comes from one of those stereotypical towns where no one leaves, and the fact that you'd leave to you know study art of all things, it's just completely out there. And she this, she's in this school that's mostly filled with uh, you know. Uh, artist people with money to go to, <laughs> to, to a humanities uh, education like this. And uh, she bonds with one of the only other, you know, lower uh, class uh, socioeconomic people named Mel Vaught. Uh, she comes from uh, Florida uh, and uh, her family is pretty tragic. Her uh, mother was uh, a drug abuser and a prostitute who ended up in prison. Uh, and so the two of them sort of bond and the prologue, it's about the two of them really bonding over like their eccentric uh, out there, you know, experiences and artwork. Um, and then we jump 10 years into the future when the two of them are living in New York City. Uh, and they've been working together for, you know, the last 10 years as animators doing uh, cartoon work, uh, mostly adult uh, style cartoons. And they recently won a very prestigious grant uh, for this uh, movie length uh, cartoon they did, which was mostly um, a retelling of Mel's uh, formative years growing up with her mother. Uh, and so they won a big grant for this and we're opening up when there's a lot of press over uh, this event. But Mel is a very caustic character. She's uh, just uh, very uh, in your face and uh, 
uh, prickly and uh, always trying to push the envelope uh, and uh, sort of be as uh, out there as she can be. And Sharon's kind of the one kind of pulling uh, the reins on her and doing sort of the, uh, keeping the operation afloat in all the ways that largely go unnoticed because Mel is largely considered to be the uh, artistic genius of the two of them. Uh, and so we start there and uh, things progress. Uh, a lot goes on in this novel. Uh, Sharon has a, a medical tragedy and uh, it's during the time when uh, they're trying to figure out their next project. And it turns into Sharon unearthing things from her own past about uh, a event that happened when she was young, something that she uncovered uh, from at a neighbor's house with her friend who was the neighbor's son uh, that uh, really uh, I think it was like a dark part of her past and informed a lot of how she uh, went through life in the future uh, and so uh, she's actually uh, getting to know her family and this neighbor for the first time in years but she's also kind of doing research on them in this way that might come back to bite her because they might not be so thrilled with what she is uh, putting to page and ultimately to screen in their next, uh, you know, uh, feature uh, cartoon uh, animated film. Uh, so yeah, uh, not trying to spoil too much, but this is a book that's very much, you know, about friendship and relationships and uh, and romance and like how you see yourself in the world and uh, and about what it is to live this artistic lifestyle. You know, it feels like it ebbed and flowed a little bit. Like for a while we were focusing more on uh, Sharon's relationships with these people who she has a lot of history with. Uh, and then a lot, but then we have other chapters which are very much about like existing in the grind of, uh, you know, of being in that state of uh, kinetic frenzy of inspiration and st and staying up at all hours. And both of them don't have uh, the best, uh, the healthiest relationships uh, going back to drinking and drugs. Uh, uh, they both uh, tend to do a lot of that and are part of that lifestyle as well. Uh, but uh, there's just so many just just searing relationships in here. I mean, the big one, of course, is between the two women. Uh, Mel, who is this uh, caustic uh, and uh, out there queer woman constantly with a new woman. Uh, and uh, Sharon, who uh, also like, like is known for her uh, basic uh, obsessive crushes on men. And sometimes they go somewhere and sometimes don't. And like her sort of going through her relationships with these men is the impetus of uh, getting this project off the ground. Uh, and of course their relationships to themselves and who they are as artists and who they are in their families. There's a lot of family issues to unpack, especially for Sharon and her family and uh, Sharon with her old neighbor. And I just, uh, I just feel like it was really just, well, it was deeply compelling. I was uh, turning the pages and it just had so much to say about art and about like, you know, the geography of where you grow up and the relationships you have with those around you and how you see yourself out there in the world, especially uh, as an artist on the edge like this. Uh, so uh, I just, uh, I was, I was really just compelled throughout the whole thing. And, you know, I, I'm especially a sucker for characters who really come together for me and an environment that feels so fully, uh, uh, researched, uh, I mean, for the, for, I mean, for, by the author, but also for the reader, like that we get to be enmeshed in, in a complex world. Uh, so yeah, I am so glad I finally read this. Next, I'm about halfway through this audiobook, This Woven Kingdom by Tahara Mafi. So this is a YA fantasy book that came out last year. I think it uh, was on the Goodreads Choice Awards, uh, and that's how I, uh, first, uh, you know, uh, hooked on to it. And in fact, I think the sequel just came out this year. So part of the reason I wanted to listen to this audiobook uh, is to decide whether or not I wanted to read the sequel, because uh, I have in mind my uh, front list uh, reading that I want to get to, because I don't read a lot of front list, but I like to read at least a few things in the genres that interest me uh, per year so that maybe I could then, you know, vote in the Goodreads Choice Awards or something like that. And apparently I start my angsting about that early, uh, but it's because I, I just don't read a lot of front lists. Like I know so many booktubers I read and, you know, you always can uh, rely on them to be reading and reviewing the stuff that's really coming out or has, hasn't even quite come out yet, but I'm predominantly a backlist reader. Oh, there's just so much to read. What can I say? But anyway. <laughs> 
Uh, so this is a uh, YA fantasy book uh, in a secondary world. This is, you know, my bread and butter in a way. Uh, uh, the story takes place in this uh, kingdom of uh, humans, uh, but it used to be a kingdom of jinn or an empire of jinn who uh, ended up uh, pissing off uh, the powers that be that were above them and being lumped in with the devil. And so they lost all their powers and all their prestige and uh, the people of clay replaced them. Uh, and now the jinn basically live as refugees uh, and uh, go from place to place and are treated very poorly. Uh, and so that's what's going on with uh, one of our main characters, Amina, who is uh, living as a servant who is uh, deeply, deeply mistreated uh, by uh, the, the people she works for. Uh, is being worked to the bone, I think in part because jinn are supposed to be more powerful uh, than humans. Uh, and she's also attempting to be a seamstress on the side because her story is a travesty, basically, of poverty and want. Uh, and our second character is a prince, Kaman, who came back from the front, as it were, and he's hyper aware of um, threats against uh, the kingdom and possible spies. And so he latches on to Amina, thinking she's a spy at first. Uh, and But then uh, as he uh, gets to, to sort of know her from afar, uh, his opinion of her changes. But then her his grandfather finds out that, in fact, Amina is not quite what she seems. And not only is she a jinn, because there are jinn who, you know, are in the kingdom, but she is um, an heir to the kingdom of Jin, as it were. She's meant to be the queen because of uh, the ice cold blood she has, which is a rarity, but it's meant to be the signal that she's supposed to rule the Jin. And he's, you know, terrified of her, you know, getting the Jin together, who are mostly mistreated, uh, and getting them together to revolt and to take back the kingdom, and he can't have that. So he's setting off to kill her, and Kaman is having. Uh, a lot of conflicted thoughts about what's going on, and that's basically where we are so far in this halfway point of the story. Kaman also is being uh, coerced into getting married, and uh, he's going to be, uh, you know, his grandfather's heir. His father is dead, so he's the next heir, and his grandfather believes he is at uh, uh, death's door, or soon to be. And also, both Amina and the grandfather have had... Uh, uh, portentous visits. Uh, the grandfather and all princes, it seems, have this sort of prophecy given to them. It's either like something by the devil that you have to avoid, or it's something by the diviners that you have to watch out for, but like in a more, you know, positive way or trusting way. But basically what the grandfather's message was is that he would be overthrown, and so that's why he's so focused on Amina. Meanwhile, Amina got this weird riddle message from the devil about a man who, uh, uh, achieved immortality by killing children, and she thinks it applies to the prince, and she's not quite sure how, but, uh, so drama and tension abound. Uh, and, and I'm enjoying it. I, I'm enjoying the story. Uh, I feel like it's pretty typical in a way. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the politics of it are pretty black and white, it seems like, in terms of, uh, abusers and, uh, and, those who are being oppressed. I mean, we don't know much about the humans other than they're in power and uh, want to stay there. Or at least, well, the, the royals do. There's also uh, lower class people, uh, humans who aren't treated so well. Um, and Amina is just sort of this stereotypically uh, overwhelmed and and tragic and saintly sort of figure who uh, there's just no bad bone in her body and everything about her really ties into the tragedy of what she's dealing with. Uh, so it's uh, simple in that way. So, you know, I like the story. It's kind of fun to follow, but I can't love it just because it's kind of simple in that way. I don't know. I, I've been thinking a lot about YA fantasy and how I guess I'm not as I don't know if I'm as drawn to it lately as I used to be, which is a little worrisome since I'm writing YA fantasy. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'd like to still keep reading it or finding uh, stories I enjoy. And, and this is the story. I think I, I, I enjoy it, but I wouldn't love it. So far, I guess I'll continue to the se sequel, maybe. Uh, <laughs> maybe it depends on what else I find uh, that interests me. Uh, I was trying to think what I would be interested in reading in YA fantasy these days. Uh, and... Uh, 
the first thing I'd glomp onto in all cases is uh, Jewish-inspired fantasy. Uh, in secondary worlds, I'm not really much of an urban fantasy person for the most part. Uh, I'm much more into epic fantasy, secondary world fantasy type of stuff. And anything having uh, to do with Jewish retellings ultimately intrigues me. There's a lot out there I haven't read yet even that I hope to. Uh, and I'm keeping my eye out for what's coming out in the future. Other things that could interest me are retellings of myths and stories that I already like or, an intri or am intrigued by. Uh, and I don't know, maybe for YA fantasy, sometimes I, I, I feel like I should just go deep into, you know, angsty uh, YA ro fantasy romance or maybe. Uh, <laughs> or just something I hope that, I mean, all I really hope for is compelling characters and like you in a soap opera fashion is fine with me but just that uh, if they're just compelling I would love it if the world building really leapt off the page I would love a little more complexity I suppose and uh, the uh, backstory relationships between groups of people and that sort of thing uh, so it's all, sometimes it's hard to see what what will what will fit that bill uh, just from reading synopses. Uh, but I guess that's uh, what I'd be most interested in YA fantasy. So I plan to keep my uh, eyes and ears open for that coming up in the future. But for now, uh, I'm doing okay with this Woven Kingdom. You know, I feel like I, it could be better, but I'm doing okay with it too. <laughs> and finally, next on my docket is. Also a poet, Frank O'Hara, My Father and Me by Ada Calhoun. This is a memoir about a woman who I think finds notes that her father is writing uh, this uh, biography of a poet, uh, that sort of thing. And she takes on the mantle of that. And I believe the tenor of this story then goes into her relationship, not only with this poet, Frank O'Hara, but also with her father, I believe is the case. But that is all I will be saying about this here because I will be reading this for the BookTube Prize as an official judge. Anyway, the BookTube Prize was started by Robert at Barter Hordes a few years ago. The point is for the literary book community to come together and judge the best of literary fiction and nonfiction published in the U.S. the year before. Uh, so yes, I am uh, judging the ballot with this book on it. I'm hoping to at least start it before the end of February. Uh, and then I will be uh, pitting it against the other uh, five books on my ballot uh, and then by the end of March, I have to submit my ballot uh, and my ratings to Robert, so we can move on to the next round. Right now, we're in the first round called the Octafinals, and uh, then uh, starting in April, we'll be into the quarterfinals. And in April, I'll be able to share my true thoughts about this book. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, if you'd like my preliminary thoughts and more info on the BookTube Prize, I will leave that linked below. So that about covers it for me now. I do feel like I'm hoping to cram a lot of stuff into the end of the month, which <laughs> not uh, just have a lot to do probably starting this weekend, uh, getting a lot of it done, like uh, the reading so that I can get to my final uh, video of the month. I hope to get this out by the 28th where I read and review these two collections at last. Uh, I also have a big uh, writing deadline coming up on that day as well. <laughs> So, a lot going on there. I hope you're having maybe an easier, uh, less cram to the gills uh, end to your month and uh, whatever you have going on, or that at least you're enjoying it. So, thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.